Sundaman, how's the investigation going? Captain Mutton, actually, I found a suspicious looking expression. What is this? Is DX being square? We often see DX in calculus, but I've never seen DX squared before. And that's not the only strange thing. Look at this one too. DX is in a weird place. Intuitively, DX represents a small change in X. A small change in X? So it's an infinitesimal? Is it okay to just use infinitesimals in calculations like that? No, that would be problematic. Infinitesimal numbers don't actually exist. But this expression treats DX as if it's a standalone quantity. Almost as if it's a single variable on its own. This expression is quite strange. But you've probably seen dy by dx before, haven't you? Yeah, this represents the derivative of y with respect to x. I'm glad you remembered that. dy by dx looks like a fraction, but it isn't. However, it's essentially the limit of the change in y over the change in x. Oh yeah, that's right. In this definition, delta x approaches zero. So even if the limit exists, both the numerator and the denominator approach zero. That's one kind of indeterminate form, often symbolized as zero over zero. Since both the numerator and denominator approach zero, you can't define either one individually. If you try to forcibly define dx, it would make sense to take it as the limit of delta x, but that limit is exactly zero. dx ended up being not even infinitesimal, just zero. That's kind of a problem. Of course, intuitively we like to treat dx and dy as infinitesimals. And some differentiation formulas make it seem like symbols such as dx can exist on their own and be treated like variables. Yeah, I've always found that kind of puzzling. What would happen if we accepted the existence of infinitesimals? That sounds interesting. In modern mathematics, various approaches have been developed to handle infinitesimals rigorously. But for now, let's be bold and accept the existence of infinitesimals. That's a pretty bold move. Well, yeah, it's something I've been curious about too. We were taught that dx has no standalone meaning, and that infinitesimals are not actual numbers. But if we broke that rule and accepted the idea of infinitesimals, what kind of world would open up beyond that? Then shall we venture into that forbidden realm? Just be aware, beyond this point there's no guarantee of rigor. That sounds kinda scary. But it seems that in physics and engineering, infinitesimals are often used informally. So if we think of it as one kind of intuitive understanding, it's not entirely wrong. Well then, let's get started. A world where infinitesimals exist. This is where it all begins. Is this the definition of dx? dx is an infinitesimal change in x. Infinitesimal sounds vague, but it means something extremely close to zero, right? Hmm, I kinda get it, but not really. So we can say that dx is one example of an infinitesimal. It might not be a strict definition, but let's take it that way and move on. Got it. Next. Let's define what dy is. Just like dx, dy represents an infinitesimal change in y. So dy is also an infinitesimal but a different one from dx. Ah, uh, hold on a second. Can things really work with definitions like this? Uh, well, we won't know until we try. Now I'm starting to get a little worried. Well, I guess we can keep going for now. Okay, let's define differentiation. The derivative of y with respect to x, dy by dx, represents the ratio of the infinitesimal change in y to the infinitesimal change in x. Uh, that sounds simpler than I expected. But is that really okay? Let's look at an example. Here, we try differentiating the function y equals x squared. Now let's calculate using the definition we just introduced. And then? And then? Wait, what? What do we do next again? Feels like we're missing something. Also, what exactly is an infinitesimal change in y? You're right. We can't go forward like this. Looks like something's missing. There must be a clue hidden in the usual definition of differentiation. Wait, that's where this is going? Let's take this as the graph of the function y equals f of x. And let's fix x. Now, if we move delta x away from x, the x coordinate becomes x plus delta x. Since the change in the x direction is written as delta x, we'll denote the change in the y direction as delta y. By the way, the diagram shows both delta x and delta y as positive, but they could actually be negative as well. Okay, delta y over delta x is the average rate of change between two points. Or, in other words, the slope of the line connecting the two points. Oh yeah, that's right. 
Now, let delta x approach zero. If you look at the graph, it looks like this. This gives us the tangent line at x. Let me go back a bit. Since delta y over delta x is the slope of the line connecting two points, if the limit exists, it represents the slope of the tangent line at x. And that is the formal definition of the derivative of y with respect to x, dy by dx. We haven't used infinitesimals yet, have we? So far, so good. Can we write delta y more specifically here? More specifically? Uh, let's see. Looking at the diagram, delta y is the difference between this point and that one. So we can write it like this. Yes, that looks correct. Now let's think about the case where delta x is very close to zero. At that point we can think of delta x as becoming dx and delta y as becoming dy. Wait, aren't dx and dy supposed to be infinitesimals? But here they still seem to have finite values. Well, think of it as just an image. The important point is, if we replace delta x with dx, then delta y can be replaced with dy. That's the way we can think about it. Ah uh, yeah, that makes sense. If we accept the existence of infinitesimals, that kind of equation does seem to work. Now, to summarize the key point, when we have a function y equals f of x, the infinitesimal change in y dy can be expressed using the infinitesimal change in x dx, like this. By the way, note that this is sometimes also written as dx. If we divide both sides by dx, we get the definition of the derivative using infinitesimals. Huh? This looks kind of familiar. That's right. The definition of the derivative with infinitesimals looks very similar to the rigorous definition using the limit. You can see how dx corresponds to delta x. If we use infinitesimals, we can express the ratio of small changes without using the limit. We sacrifice rigor, but the formula becomes simpler. Now, following this definition, let's actually try doing a differentiation. For convenience and calculations, we'll use the notation df from now on. So df is the infinitesimal change of f expressed in terms of dx. I'm not sure if we can really calculate derivatives this way, but, alright, I'll go along with it for now. First, we start by differentiating this function. f of x equals 2x. That's a pretty basic function. Let's calculate df according to the definition. Since f of x equals 2x, this part becomes 2x plus dx. And this part is 2x. Yes, that's correct. Let's expand the parentheses. Then the 2x terms cancel each other. And only 2dx remains. It's kind of a strange looking expression, but at least we managed to calculate df. So df equals 2dx. Ah, uh, so, what do we do from here? Can you get the derivative from this? Get the derivative? Oh, I see. If we divide both sides by dx, we get this. Yes, that looks good. So in summary, when we differentiate 2x, the result is 2. And that indeed matches the derivative we already know. That was a pretty strange calculation. Let's look at one more example. This time it's s of x equals x squared. It's a little trickier than the previous one. Alright, we should calculate df according to the definition. Since f of x equals x squared, we can write the expression like this. And expanding the parentheses gives this. The x squared terms cancel each other out. So here's the final result. Now dx squared appears. We saw that at the beginning of this video. Since dx is an infinitesimal, dx squared means an infinitesimal multiplied by an infinitesimal. So is it an even smaller infinitesimal? That's a short observation. Compared to dx, dx squared is considered a much smaller infinitesimal. Here we call dx squared a higher order infinitesimal relative to dx. In this case, we can ignore the higher order infinitesimal, so the answer is 2x dx. Wait, is it really okay to just ignore it? That's a pretty bold move. That's one of the strange things about calculations with infinitesimals. But if we allow ourselves to think that way, the result becomes much cleaner. Just like before, if we divide both sides by dx, we get this. So this means the derivative of x squared is 2x. As expected, we got the correct result. That higher order infinitesimal idea turned out to be useful. Differentiation with infinitesimals. It's strange, but it seems to work out correctly for now. It seems so. But so far, it just feels like it's a bit easier to write than using limits. Actually, the true power of infinitesimals probably hasn't shown itself yet. Huh? Really? What kind of true power could that be? Sundamon, be careful! The problem is coming. What? Whoa, this is... 
This is the product rule. When differentiating the product of f and g, you just add the case where f is differentiated to the case where g is differentiated. This is something we use a lot in differentiation. So that means... That means we now have to prove this formula using infinitesimals. I knew it would come to this. From here on the difficulty level rises so be careful. I'm starting to feel a little nervous. So, where should we start? Oh, uh, let's see. We can probably use the definition of df as an infinitesimal. The infinitesimal change in f, df, can be expressed using dx like this. And then, what do we do next? Alright. Since we want to find the derivative of fg, let's first compute the infinitesimal change in fg. According to the definition, dfg can be written like this. Huh? Wait, what just happened? Let me explain. We just replaced f with fg in the definition of df. That means f of x takes the form of a product, f of x g of x. Similarly, f of x plus dx also takes the form of the product. Ah, I see. I might get it. Or maybe not. And if we rearrange the definition of df by moving f of x to the left hand side, we get this equation. Applying this, f of x plus dx becomes this. And g of x plus dx becomes that. By the way, I've omitted the variable x here. Wait, huh? Right now, we're extending the product f plus df times g plus dg. We could keep expanding normally, but let's visualize it with a diagram instead. Here, f plus df is this side, and g plus dg is that side. df and dg are infinitesimals, yet you're writing them like finite values. I'd appreciate it if you didn't point that out. Now, multiplying f plus df and g plus dg gives the area of the entire rectangle. Then we subtract fg, so what's left is dfg and fdg. The term dfdg in the top right is the product of two infinitesimals, so it's a higher order infinitesimal relative to df or dg and can be ignored. I kinda get it, but... Okay, I don't fully get it, but we managed to get this equation. Now, just like before, we divide both sides by dx. And it turns into this. It looks complicated at first, but this is exactly the product rule. Excellent work, Sundaman. That was a bit long, but... The key point of the proof is really this diagram. If we ignore dfdg as a higher order infinitesimal, then the infinitesimal change in fg is the sum of these two rectangles. This diagram shows the situation before dividing both sides by dx, so you can see how it matches the product rule. Now that you say that, yeah, I see it. By accepting infinitesimals, we can sometimes prove formulas neatly, even if not rigorously, and it's a useful way to understand the meaning of the proof. This time we assume the existence of infinitesimals, but can infinitesimals actually be defined rigorously? This is quite a deep question, but as one possible answer, there is another video that explains a method to rigorously define dx and dy, and to treat dy by dx as a fraction. If you're interested, please check it out. Well then, take care everyone. See you later.